All right, let's pray. Lord, Lord. Uh, Lord Jesus, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for uh, a new day of life. I thank you for this new year. I thank you for the opportunity to uh, be with this men, these men, just to share my story. And I pray that you would uh, just speak through me uh, to, uh, to share um, what's going on in my life and what you've called me to do here in Decatur. And uh, just bless these men, bless this, uh, this gathering. I'll pray in Jesus' name. Everybody say, Amen. 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 First of all, I want to wish you all a very happy uh, New Year. Uh, hey. One of the things that went from me and my family, the people of Tree, and also just being the campus pastor at the LSA. So I just wanted to say it's a privilege to be here with you this morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to come and just share my life, my heart, my passion. Um, and three things I want to talk about today. I just want to talk about um, just my life, just in, in, uh, include you in that so you can know who I am. I want to talk about the LSA and uh, what I do there. And want to talk about Tree, Tree Community Church, a very unique vision, and uh, what I want to share with, uh, with you about that. I want to apologize for missing the November 2nd meeting here. Mm -hmm. I came down with pneumonia after running the Indianapolis Half Marathon wow. with uh, George's uh, son-in-law, Shane Mendenhall. We were training for <laughs> months over the summer. Shane ran the Portland Marathon. Uh, a couple weeks before, we went to do the Indian Half Marathon together, and we woke up on Saturday uh, morning in Indianapolis, 38 degrees, and uh, it was cold, it was raining, and I ended up uh, just uh, just freezing, <laughs> freezing. My legs uh, were numb at the finish, and uh, I ended up coming down with pneumonia. So I thank you for finding a speaker and uh, doing that uh, so that... It's also the valid excuse. Yeah. It's awesome to run for your health and end up sick. Isn't it? <laughs> that's right. I've my health and uh, done that. So, uh, that's why I avoid it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's good. I, I just uh, it was just good to, to run, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, so I was born in uh, September 26, 1974. I turned 40 this year, so I'm 39 years young. I grew up in northern Iowa where it is colder than here, so very cold. I just talked to my dad last night. It is going to be 25 below back home in my hometown of Ventura, Iowa. It's a small village on a beautiful Clear Lake in northern Iowa, halfway between uh, Minneapolis and Des Moines. Uh, it's kind of where I grew up. Population about a thousand. It's kind of like Macon, um, uh, Macon, Maroa around here. I kind of went to a Maroa Forsyth, if you really thought so. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad and grandparents still live back in my hometown. Went back there Thanksgiving and really enjoyed that. My mother lives in Clear Lake. Uh, one thing you need to know about me at uh, about 2004, at the age of 30, my, my parents divorced and uh, at 34 years of marriage. So that doesn't define me, but it just kind of. Uh, was a bump in the road for sure you know so mm -hmm. i have gone you know i'm kind of uh, the son of divorced parents uh, i want to let you know that's something that i i definitely minister to and speak out to mm -hmm. at the lsa i have a lot of kids who come to talk to me because uh, they're from divorced parents or something mm -hmm. we, we we have a lot of divorced uh, kids or divorced parents in this uh in this uh, community uh, my only brother, Travis, lives with his wife, Rebecca, and his son, Porter, in Anchorage, Alaska, where he is a bush pilot, a uh, commercial pilot, and uh, works for Peter Pan Seafoods out of Seattle. So that is cool. I have grown up loving sports. I played football. I played basketball, track, and golf. I love music. I was also a choir boy in uh, high school, and uh, I love bands. So I really speak out at my school that real men sing. Real men sing. And uh, they're in band, they express themselves. God has given us voices. He's given us instruments to express ourselves. I love the, the arts. I actually went to uh, Luther College and sang all the way through college. That's the way I put myself through college and on scholarship and on grants <laughs> from that. Um, I actually didn't, uh, I played college basketball. Um, kind of, you know, where I went to Luther is kind of like Milliken, but mm -hmm. uh, I played for a couple years there and it was awesome. So I attended Luther College in Decor, Iowa, which is in the northeast corner. Um, I graduated, really didn't know what I wanted to do. I graduated with history and Russian studies minor and doing all that. I had no idea how God was going to use that. One of the unique things about um, uh, my life is um, I did an internship at the Smithsonian Institution. At one time, I thought I wanted to be Indiana Jones and uh, kind of work in museums, and I traveled around the world and do that. But uh, God had different... Um, plans for me. I eventually moved to Austin, Texas, where it is a lot warmer than here. Okay? <laughs> I got really tired of the 35 below at Luther, 
and uh, just ask God, would you, you know, where am I going? Would you move me uh, maybe somewhere else where it's warmer? So he uh, put it on my heart, deep conviction, that I was to move to Austin, Texas. Uh, I went there to pursue a master's degree in uh, museum studies, information systems at the University of Texas. God had other plans for sure. Um, I ended up getting involved in a campus church there that really uh, that changed my life. God worked through it to change my life. Um, I had grown up uh, knowing the Lord, but had never really personally received him. I knew mm -hmm. him. It doesn't, isn't that a familiar thing? Yeah. I knew all about him growing up in church, kind of the institutionalized church in ways. I knew about him. I had never really received him as my personal Lord and Savior. Uh, but it was at this uh, church. I met a pastor. I met friends. And it was, I want to let you know, it was community. It was a small group in the mm -hmm. small groups where I um, laid my life down and I surrendered. Um, I, I just became... Uh, I was broken, there was a lot of immorality in my life and other things I was dealing with. Um, and so I, I, I just laid my life down before the Lord at this time. I actually met a pastor there who I wanted to be. He was a marathon runner. Mm. He was just, he had an authentic walk with the Lord, a uh, personal relationship, and uh, I just uh, loved that. So um, after that, I kind of got into uh, children and youth ministry. Um, just by chance, the, the Lord moved me into that. Even though I had no experience, um, I had grown up in the church helping my mom and dad in children's ministry and stuff, and uh, he moved me into that. It was at uh, that uh, church doing children youth ministry that my wife moved in, uh, came into my life. So my life had been changed by the Lord. He started building on a new foundation, not on Troy, but on him. And my, life, or my wife walked into my life, and that was just amazing. She, she was actually helping with the children and youth ministry at, uh, at the church that we were at, so that was awesome. Um, after that, um, uh, we got married. All the kids in our youth group were a part of our wedding. It was awesome. And uh, I just uh, had a deep conviction. I need to be equipped. I need to be equipped. So um, I had grown up uh, Lutheran my whole life, you know, by uh, just in, in, in uh, I just felt called to uh, seminary. So I went to Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, where I earned my Master's of Divinity, uh, Divinity in 2005. Um, and after I graduated, um, I actually came here to get Decatur, became the associate pastor at St. Paul's Lutheran Church, which is uh, up now on, uh, uh, in the Backrack Warehouse now, up there. Uh, I had been an intern here and had loved it. People were like, why do you love Decatur? I love Decatur. I love <laughs> Decatur. Um, I want to tell you, from uh, traveling around and being at, having to travel like 30 to 45 minutes in Austin because of traffic, uh, being in St. Louis, I lived in St. Louis, and traffic, traffic, traffic. I love Decatur because I can get across the city in 10 to 15 minutes. Um, I can go visit those places, um, and they're, they're wonderful, but um, I just I love it for that reason. I love the people here, and, uh, and I'm called here to be here, that's for sure. Um, after we were here, my wife and I, it was revealed to us that we were to build our family and part of our mission as a, as a couple through adoption, okay? So um, we have adopted two children from central China, who are my son and my daughter, Tai, who is uh, six years old, uh, born in 2007, Remy 2009, both from Zhangzhou, Henan, China. So we had a great time, just uh, we became a global international family through that and have loved that. Um, but in my spare time, um, I just love uh, reading books, uh, spending time. I love running. Um, I was a triathlete for a while here in Decatur, kind of gave that up because of, of time. But um, I also love the Big Ten. I love the Big Ten. Anybody Big Ten fans here? And uh, SEC. Okay, I'm going to brace myself. <laughs> and I'm a, I'm a lifelong Hawkeye, right? So oh, yeah. I love the Illini. I love uh, the Big Ten, but I grew up a, a Hawkeye. Um, my life verse that I wanted to share with you guys here today is Titus 3, 3 through 7. At one time, we, uh, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit, uh, whom he poured out us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. And I can tell you um, just that uh, I was <laughs> foolish at one time, many times, and uh, continue to be at times in, in, uh, in sinfulness. I was disobedient, I was dece deceived, enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. I lived in malice and at one time hating and hating other people. 
but I just want you to know, Jesus saved me. Um, not because of what anything I've done, but just because of his grace and mercy. And so I just love Jesus. I just love Jesus. Uh, and maybe that's just personally for you, how he's rescued me out. Um, and he specifically, he called me at a youth conference in New Mexico and convicted me that my life was to be for him and not for myself. Um, another one of my favorite verses is Ephesians 4.11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers to do this, to equip his people uh, for works of service, works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure and the fullness of Christ. Why I wanted to read that to you and uh, move on to part number two is just, I'm a campus pastor at LSA. And so um, in May 2011, after serving five years at St. Paul's, I was part-time teacher at the LSA. I just felt a deep conviction to get back into children and youth ministry um, at the high school. I just love teenagers. I love kids. And I thought I can make a deep kingdom impact yeah. in their lives every day with these kids. And uh, I love St. Paul's, where I was, but I was called uh, to be in the lives of these teenagers. So every day, I want you to know, I teach about 130 teenagers um, every day. So we're going to have a snow day on probably on Monday. So <laughs> that'll be great. I won't see them until Tuesday. Um, Do we need to pray for you? Yeah, you need to pray for me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pray for me. So I'm going on um, my third year there. Um, some people say, hey, why did you move from St. Paul's? And, I, and uh, I, I just said, I love kids. I love youth ministry uh, because I know my impact is going to live on through these kids for generations right. and in their families and then their marriages. Okay. So that's a big thing. One thing you need to know um, beyond um, just kind of being in the Lutheran church I really want to tell you guys, I am a kingdom-centered pastor. I am a kingdom-centered, beyond denomination, beyond this, uh, in the focus on the kingdom. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to encourage these kids in three ways um, to give their lives to Jesus Christ and live a, a lifestyle of worship every day, to see that he is their Lord and Savior. Number two, that they would build one another up in a sense of community. And that's a big thing that we do at LSA. We literally have them in prides that every month they get together in community and small groups to get to know each other and build one another up. Um, we also really take um, you know, our time to work on any bullying or anything like that. So we have that kind of community. We are not perfect, but we're really working on that um, because that's, a, that's the second part of being God's people. And the third, that I'm trying to build them into transformational leaders in the world, okay? They have a mission. Every single one of them has a calling and a specific mission. And I want them to know some of them are so uh, struggling with who they are and their identity. So we're going through uh, uh, just spiritual gifts, and I want to help them um, figure out who they are. So in their relationships, in their corporations, their communities, where they end up, they will be um, leaders, something that I think BMIC stands for, right? In, in life, in marriage, in their, in their businesses, okay? And bring kingdom impact um, and kingdom authority uh, to that to bring change because whoever's underneath them, um, I want them to be servant leaders. I, I keep telling them over time, people are not there to just serve you. You're there to serve them. And uh, as Jesus uh, laid down his life for you, um, you're there to lay down your life for others. So Matthew 6, 33, 35 is, is huge. Seek first the kingdom. Uh, I got that on a plaque from China and uh, is, is huge. But I just, I just noticed that Jesus um, only says church twice in the Gospels. You know how many times he says kingdom? It bowled me over. 116 times. Wow. Okay? So the focus of our life and my life shouldn't be just my church. Okay? Right. It should be the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Right? Amen. The kingdom. Amen. The kingdom. Because the kingdom is greater. The kingdom is greater than uh, my local church. The kingdom is universal. So I'm just focusing on, on that. Um, what else? Um, so just to wrap up there, there is really um, uh, about five things I've been doing. I teach the Old Testament from Genesis to Nehemiah, and uh, we do all kinds of projects. But I teach in chronological order. Actually, I put the books in chronological order and teach them through because the... I don't know if you know, but the Old Testament books are out of order, Yeah. right? It's Genesis, Job, 
and then Exodus and blah, blah, blah. So it's really fun to teach the story. As they get to know the story, they can go deeper for the rest of their life. I teach the story of the New Testament. Um, I currently ter uh, teach the works of, of C.S. Lewis as, as well to juniors. So the first two years are Old Testament, New Testament. And we even get into um, um, looking at different denominations, but we talk about the kingdom. I, I, re I recently had them go out and interview uh, 25 different pastors from 25 or, uh, denominations around one class. And that was, that was a lot of fun. We also talk about <laughs> cults, the occult, and different religions. Um, and I also organize the high school chapels um, every Wednesday and do that. Uh, and this, even this fall, um, I was the high school cross country coach because that's what I did in uh, um, as well. So uh, it's just a lot of fun, uh, and, and I enjoy that. Okay, and finally, I want to talk about uh, tree. Um, something I have been led to on October 10, 2010, officially planted uh, Tree Community Church. Uh, we call it Tree for short, Indicator, um, and I am the I call myself the lead servant, lead servant. Uh, Lead pastor, lead servant. My wife and I came under deep conviction from the Lord uh, to plant a tree when we went to England in 2005. We went to St. Thomas Church in Sheffield, England, just a kingdom-focused church, and experienced relationship-based, um, a missional church built on missional house churches and missional communities. Um, so what was really different about it was that they didn't uh, totally emphasize getting together on Sunday, Sunday was important for celebration and worship and not taking away, but the biggest thing was planting missional communities in uh, the city, in neighborhoods, in houses that um, people could uh, witness to others, to their neighbors and say, here's the church. It's literally, this is a way to bring church to the people and not ask people to come to the church, right? Mm -hmm. um, so Jesus said, go, he didn't say come. Right? So y'all come. He said, go. So that's a definitely uh, a different uh, thing we'll talk about. So the vision of tree is uh, we're not really your typical American church um, where we're identifying as a, a church as a building or event or a place. Um, but it really is we're identifying as people uh, where the church gathers. Um, we're, we're saying it, it needs to be simple, it needs to be relational, uh, it needs to have the core values of, of Jesus. Talk about that in a second. Because ultimately, the family of God is, is a family. It's about relationships and being a people on uh, the move. How I would describe it is, is two part. We are really an underground church. And uh, I became uh, convicted about that because when I went to uh, China, everybody know about China? And uh, there are house churches in China, and kind of, uh, there's mm -hmm. underground. So underground is kind of looking at a tree and the roots. Um, the roots are kind of like the relationships. We need to be built on relationships. And uh, uh, people living out their faith daily, a lifestyle, not just, uh, um, just uh, uh, going to church is important and gathering, but we need to have a lifestyle of faith that we live out every single day. And those uh, really highlighting the weekdays are very, very important. Uh, he says in Acts 20, uh, Paul says that we need to gather from house to house. And um, really, faith gets its start. I, I have this deep conviction. Faith gets its start in the home. It gets its faith in the home. Uh, because if I'm not, if it's, uh, no, um, and it's, uh, if it's not going on in my life, um, if it's not going on in my marriage, in my, in my family, um, then uh, that's important because every family should be a church unto itself. It's like uh, it's a church in the home. Um, I just noticed in 1 Timothy and Titus as well, all the qualifications of being a spiritual father and elder come out of the home. It has to start in the home. It has to start in the home. And so um, I'm trying to get church back in the home where people are living it out. One of the convictions in children and youth ministry is people were having... They were giving me their children and saying, you disciple them. And I was like, no, I want you to disciple them. Because you're the parents and you're the people. And I deal with this at school. If it doesn't happen at home, it ain't going to happen at school, you know? Because some people want us to raise their children and be spiritual parents. And we're going to be the spiritual parents in ways. But we're really trying to help families to disciple their children at home. It be begins in the home. And I think... Um, House churches are the original way that the church uh, grew, um, and it's it truly a call, um, calling. So that's underground church. But we do have above-ground church where we come together every Sunday, and we actually gather 
uh, in a home, in a large home, and we celebrate and we worship, and it's a big family reunion um, to strengthen one another. I give vision, I preach there, um, but we're not building based. Um, we don't have that overhead of a building, and that's just the calling on us, um, and, you know, and just other things that uh, we have to worry about. So we keep it simple. Uh, just a couple of things I want to share, and just wrapping up here. Um, this is the key scripture for tree, 1 Peter 2, 23 through 25. Um, and uh, Peter was talking about Jesus. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly, to his heavenly father. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness by his wounds, you have been healed. For you uh, were um, like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd uh, and overseer of your, soul, of your souls. Okay? So there, on the tree, he bore our sins to heal us and, uh, and to free us. 1 Peter 2, 23 through 25. And then uh, we have uh, Acts 20, 20, where Paul says, You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. So there's the house to house uh, strategy, um, getting it going in the house and also coming together publicly. Um, so this month in, in February, January, we're actually going to be talking about uh, seven words, uh, convictions that come uh, from Jesus, where the core words and values of tree. And we'll be reviewing those and going deeper. And, uh, and uh, it's going to be um, what's just... The, what's the seven words? Seven words. You want me to share the seven words yeah. really quick? Seven words uh, of tree uh, that we want to be at. Number one, the number one word, turn. You have to turn from my way to God's way. You have to turn from the world's wisdom to his wisdom. You have to turn from your flesh to his spirit. Right? Is that good? Okay, you have to turn. Number two, you have to be washed. You have to be cleansed. And you have to be filled. Right? You have to cleanse that old self and be filled with the new. Right? And, uh, and uh, we, have to, we have to be washed and, and be baptized. So you've turned and you've been washed. Number three is DNA. You must be filled with the DNA uh, or live out the DNA of God's kingdom. What is that? Um, Jesus lived a life that was up and in and out. It was three-dimensional. It was to love God, love God's people, and love the broken world. You are to worship, you are to be in community, and you are to be on mission. Those are the three things of Jesus. Simply put, now, I went through four years of seminary, and I was so confused, but I can, wrap, I can wrap up the Bible in three things. <laughs> Worship and community and mission. And there's a DNA that he lived out, okay? And we're called to live that out. That is the simple life of Jesus. Now, I can live that out. It's practical. It's a lifestyle. Yeah. And I can, I, he's calling me to be a follower. He's not calling me to be a theologian. He's calling me to be a follower. But I can do that every day. I can worship every day. I can be in community every day. I'm right here yeah. with you all. And I'm going to be on mission. Um, that's it, to bring more people in. Number four is to feast. We are to uh, feast on the Lord's Supper and do that as a community. We have a communal meal. Number five, we are to pray. We are to be in a daily relationship with our Lord and Savior and to pray. Number six is to give. Give of ourself, okay? Our time, our talents, our treasures. Yeah. Because Jesus, God gave his son. He's a giving God. We are to be a giving people, okay? Number seven and the final one, even about leadership. We are to multiply. We are to multiply, disciple others. It's just not for us, okay? It's for others. So how can we multiply uh, this life into others? So I'm doing that with my students, trying to multiply the, the kingdom lifestyle into their lives as well. And ultimately, at Tree, um, through all of that, we want to emphasize that uh, we're in a covenantal community of participation, not just membership, right? You're a part of the community when you participate, um, when you're active, not just when you're passive, okay? And we love people um, there, but we want, to, we want them to uh, be, uh, uh, want to be active. At Tree, we also, we're going to follow um, a, a model of servant leadership lived out by Jesus um, because um, I'm a leader who simply serves, and I'm here to serve others uh, so that they would serve others as well, okay? I'm not here to be served. Uh, Jesus laid down his life for me. I'm here to lay it down for others, and I'm here to teach uh, my people and my students that as a, as a coach others as well. So um, 
Uh, all this is on my website. <laughs> we oh, talked really? to, yeah. and I've I've updated it. You know, treeducator dot org, and um and uh and we're up, I'm continuing to update in the next uh, week here for 2014, but at uh, at tree we'll be going through these seven words and just going deeper with that. That's great. So they're at the core of it. <laughs> but the one I really I focus on a lot is that DNA. It is the lifestyle of Jesus, and and to live that out. Um, can I wonder. Explain, also, can you explain the word missional? Missional. It's a big word. Oh, big, yeah, I know it's a big word. Um, <laughs> missional. Um, yeah. A lot of churches are two dimensional. Right. We want to be three dimensional, right. right? We just don't want to have worship and community and 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 go home. and be comfortable, right. right? A missional church has the third dimension to it, and and that comes at work. That comes. In your neighborhood, that comes in to be a, a church on the move, a, a, a church that moves through relationships, right. because that's the way the kingdom moves through relationships. That's what I mean. Yeah. The, the churches that I saw that are I, d dynamic throughout the world, they have those three dimensions to them. They have a great worship life. They have a great communal life through small groups and right. meeting together, and their people are on mission, right? And uh, they're but they they witness through their life. And people go, as the witness to their life, when they show up at work, people go, what is inside of you? Because yes. there is joy, and there is yes. hope, and there is celebration, and I am empty, and I am hollow, yes. um, but I need what's inside of you. And then they share um, with them. Because I believe that the church is best on mission when, um, I think we call it, at Tree, we're calling it a, a CO2, a church of two or three, when somebody sits down with some one-on-one -on -one and just shares with, with them, shares right. their story, shares their testimony. And that doesn't happen in a big group. It, ha it actually happens in a small community over lunch, um, right. you know, <laughs> taking a walk together and, and just sharing life together. So that's uh, it's really cool. cool. Um, I just want to um, share, I've, I've been reading Eli, just wrap up here, um, with my juniors at LSA. Here's just like some, um, some quotes uh, I just want to share from this book I love. Eli, who is, um, who is uh, Jesus, if, if Jesus came in the 1970s, uh, he was, in the book, is Eli Shepherd. So it's really the retelling of Jesus' life in a modern-day way. But uh, the, the, uh, the author is so good by sharing uh, kind of what Jesus would say uh, in, a, in a modern way. And uh, Eli says, and this would be Jesus, he says, The kingdom of heaven is more than just some place you go when you die. It's a way of life. It's a way of life. It's the way God had intended life to be lived. And the good news is that you can become citizens of that life right now while you're still on earth. So heaven is right now. You don't have to wait. Eternal life for these kids is right now. I don't have to wait to get there. I can have that joy yeah, right, right, right right now. now right Amen. now. Amen. You can give your life right now. And you can be living heaven on earth right now. You don't have to wait for down the road. And he says, uh, uh, he was talking to... Uh, this one pastor that had gotten all wrong, Eli turns and he says, he says this, um, the kingdom of God is about dying. It's about pouring your life into others regardless of the cost. It is about laying down your life so that you can receive mine, Jesus said. Um, Bigger is not better, doctor. The kingdom of God is not a part of the American dream. Hear me carefully. The kingdom of heaven, there is no greater... Um, Temptation, no greater road to ruin than worldly success. And he was saying that um, the kingdom of God is not about food courts. It's not about dating services or water parks. It has nothing to do with that. It's about um, giving your life for others and dying and living that lifestyle. So that's what I had to share for you today.